Yeah, it's, ter it's terrific to be here, and uh, much to my surprise, I saw what could be my presentation in the editorial pages of the New York Times yesterday, complete with graphs and arguments. But uh, be that as it may, let's just say that's extra reading. I actually have a summary slide at the end, if we uh, if we get that far. So. Um, I, I wrote a policy brief I, for CEPR, that's the first Sanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, back in March, which got a lot of attention. I mean, these, these things, you, ne you never know when you start writing things whether, whether you're going to hit things uh, on, on the mark or the news cycle will be totally moved on to something else by the time you've finished writing something. But this, this issue of what, what is killing the U.S. coal industry is, has been a big one. And it's been a big one ever since, uh, um, really, I think President Obama came into office. As we all know, there was a lot of opposition to President Obama. And uh, I think a lot of people or some people were looking for things to complain about Obama with. And uh, one of those was the war on coal. Now, it's, it, it did happen that, that coal did face tough times over the past 10 years or so, um, but you know, attributing it to o Obama is just oversimplified. Although the question I really want to look at is, what did happen to coal? You know, was it Obama? Was it somebody else? Was it something else? So that's that's really the the theme of today's talk. So let's uh, first of all look a little bit at uh, what has happened to coal. This is a um, it's just energy consumption since the Revolutionary War. And this is electricity generation since 1950. And, you know, the big thing to notice here is this, uh, this drop off in coal in the last, uh, really since the Great Recession. Uh, you see that magnified over here because the blue is the coal. And the coal is really used for electricity generation. So it's, it's uh, this, this is everything over here. but. Uh, th this is coal. So starting almost simultaneously with the Great Recession or simultaneously with President Obama coming into office, depending on what your druthers are, coal has taken a slide in, in the aggregate. But um, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Whoops, wrong direction. Okay, so this this is coal and jobs because really, when uh, Mr. Trump goes uh, railing uh, about coal, he's talking about the miners. He's talking about the jobs that have been killed by coal. At least that's the, what I would interpret him as saying. So here here is what we ha we have is is the production of coal um, in tons per year, and we got employment over here. So let's focus on this one first. And uh, this is the present, uh, 2016 anyway. Uh, and what we see is a, a really a, a little more nuanced picture. Uh, the total US is the red. So coal, since, uh, since basically 1950, has had, had some really good times. It's doubled in output in the US. Uh, it's only recently fallen off a bit, but it's way, way, way up over the way it was in the 50s and 60s. Um, but it, it's, it's a little bit of a, of a mixed picture. The east is this blue. That east being, you know, we're out here in California, so the east is everything to the uh, east of Nevada. But by, by east, I'm thinking uh, I'm, I'm putting the Midwest in together with Pennsylvania and uh, Appalachia. And the west really is um, the Rocky Mountains. And you see that really this is a picture of a boom in the west and pretty much stagnation in the east. So when you see these pictures of the coal miners in Ohio at Trump rallies, it's, uh, it's these guys. You know, their, their, their industry has uh, not really uh, gone anywhere positively since since World War II. In fact, it's, it's struggling and going down. If you look at jobs, it's an even bleaker picture. Uh, the national, this is the same, same time frame, around 1950, so the present, then this is employment in, in coal mining. 
And you see uh, 400,000 miners or something like that back in the, back in just after World War II, and declining uh, a bit of a boomlet in the 70s. That was a, a mini boom in coal, but a, a steady decline. And uh, this is all eastern coal. The West wasn't even making any coal to speak of until after the energy crisis of the mid 70s, early 70s. And uh, you know, just contrast this green line here is the number of employees in Western coal. You know, half of the U.S. production of coal produced with probably a few more miners than we have people in this room. That's a slight exaggeration, but uh, not many people at all. And uh, lo and behold, the Midwest and the East continuing to struggle as jobs just keep going down. Now, this isn't an Obama phenomenon. This bit here is perhaps coincident with his administration. But this is the history of Midwestern and Eastern coal. It's going down. So it's, it's really important, I think, to understand the bigger picture, the post-World War II picture. I don't see who's clar who yeah, wants to clarify. I can't see a hand, but if somebody has a clarifying question, it's great. Yeah. I had a question. Uh, just for a reference, uh, is the east and west kind of broken up by like the interconnection or just kind of like? I'll, I'll have a map roughly. in a second. Okay. I think maybe even on the next slide. Yeah, here we go. So um, this is uh, where the coal is. And this is really what I mean by the east. But, but you know, if you, want to, if you want to mince words, these are distinct areas. The east is uh, the Illinois Basin here. Uh, you've got Appalachia, you've got Texas, and you've got subdivisions within these. You know, there's some anthracite. Um, but really what I'm talking about in the east is this stuff here. And this is what I'm talking about in the west. Actually, most of it's right there. That's, wh that's where the coal comes from. Uh, this is where it goes. This is the capacity. The dark, dark states are the um, greatest amount of coal capacity for you know, electricity production. And the light states are proportionally uh, less. And uh, as many of you happen to know, I think, uh, one of the reasons coal is so important in the climate debate is this simple table of the pounds of CO2 per million BTU, which is about 100 kilowatt hours. Uh, coal, you know, all these fuels are some carbon and some hydrogen. That's why we call them uh, hydrocarbons. The more H's you got, uh, the less C's, you, you get more H's you got, the more less carbon you got per, per, per BTU. And coal, particularly the anthracite, is almost all C. So it's got the greatest amount of carbon dioxide per million BTU. And as you go down the line, natural gas is the is CH4 is the, is the best one. And so that, that, that explains some of the movement away from coal, at least on the demand side. OK, so here are some explanations that have been put forward. And, and I've got a seven other for people who want to add things. One is the environmental regulations, the war on coal. These, these are people's explanations of the reason for the decline in coal and coal jobs. One, environmental regulations, the war on coal. I'm going to take a look at each of these in a minute. Second, which people don't actually talk about too much, but is the deregulation of the railroads. You know, coal is heavy. If you're going to ship it, that's, that, that costs money. And, and uh, if, you, if the price of that comes down, that changes the spatial pattern of, of coal. The fracking revolution causing cheap natural gas to displace coal, or basically getting cheap natural gas, which subsequently displaces coal. Um, productivity gains in coal have killed jobs. You know, productivity is sort of the, is, is the bane of our modern existence and the virtue of our modern existence. It what's, it what, it's what lets us uh, individually produce so much and, and consequently get paid quite a bit. It also means we don't need so many people to produce what we had. Um, productivity gains in renewables and other energy have displaced coal. And by productivity gains, I mean it's cheaper, cheaper. Solar and wind are cheaper. 
And then financial markets have driven expectations. No matter how much Mr. Trump talks up coal, the people that are loaning money for a 30-year coal-fired power plant look beyond the current uh, presidency. They look at what are the, what's the risk associated with investing in something that the whole world is disinvesting in. And then we could have other things. I don't have any other things, but maybe somebody will think of some other things, yes? Do you think that like the so coal there's like an issue with the stranded asset in the sense that you have to you have a lot of upfront costs with purchasing it. Yeah, why don't you save that till till the end because we're we're going to go through that. Sure. It's a str only a stranded asset if you don't want it anymore. Uh, so let's look at the the first culprit, which is uh, environmental regulations. This is the theoretically Obama's war on coal. Well, really, it, it, it goes back to the 1970 landmark legislation, the Clean Air Act. That's really what governs air pollution in the United States. And the basic approach, done for very political reasons, is grandfathering. And what that means is that if, if you don't want the lobbyists to come out in herds and fight your legislation, you've got to give the people with a current vested interest some carrots not treat them so hard as the people that have yet to show up at the table. So that's what they did. They said that old sources, or new sources rather, the ones that were yet to come were subject to strict environmental regulations. They weren't there to lobby at the time. And then the old sources were exempt from regulations to a large extent. And basically it was kicked to local uh, air quality uh, administrators try to figure out something to do. And some of those were more cooperative than others. Uh, the big issue of when a major overhaul moves a plant from grandfathered has continually, for the last 50 years, come up. You know, you got an old plant, just like you, you're driving around a, uh, a 1962 Falcon, and you're not allowed to repair it. You know, you're going to try to sneak in, oh, it's just, it's just a sort of a tune-up of the water pump. Uh, uh, you know, but you know, the, you compress that too far, and the EPA's big problem is, you know, when does it become a new plant? When do you basically replace the engine with a new one and become becomes a new plant? And that's been a continual battle for a long time. So you could argue that grandfathering caused these old plants to keep on chugging far beyond their normal lifetimes, and now we're seeing that come to fruition. Uh, sulfur was a big problem addressed in the 1970s by switching to low sulfur coal. So it's sort of a sort of a, a band-aid for a decade or so. And using super tall smokestacks, which everybody I think is, has heard of, to move the pollution out of the local area so your local air, air quality monitors don't get triggered, and they ends up in some other state. Now in the 1977 Law was changed, eliminated tall stacks, at least as a way of meeting environmental regulations, and also protected areas that were currently duty, dirty, and also required scrubbers, bluegrass desulfurization on all new plants. So the, these tended to deal partially with some of the loopholes in the 1970 Act. 1990, Acid rain, of course, was the topic of the 80s, and in 1990, we did something about that by cutting overall sulfur emissions in half. Uh, starting around then, the focus tended to be on what can we do about this grandfathering problem? And one of, one of the loopholes, it's not exactly a loophole, but the original Clean Air Act said air toxics, you know, things that are really nasty in the pollution, air pollution, you don't have to adopt the grandfathering. You can go after the old sources for those. So the Clinton administration, the Bush administration, the Obama administration tried to limit those mercury emissions. They all failed. The court struck them down until Obama succeeded in 2012 with the mercury and air toxic standards, MATS, which are often blamed for closing down a lot of the coal-fired power plants. But really, you really have to look at this as old power plants limping along, and eventually something's got to give. 2007, the Supreme Court concluded that greenhouse gases has to be 
regulated, or it should be regulated by the EPA under the Clean Air Act. That's what basically the Clean Power Plan is doing. The Supreme Court said you've got to control greenhouse gases, and the Clean Power Plan was a way to do that. And in 2015, the Clean Power Plan uh, was put out, and uh, it, was, it was stayed by the Supremes. And then last week, or I guess it was, was last week, the Pruitt uh, announced that he was going to um, revise it. So here's the result of that, uh, uh, that grandfathering. The, these, this, is the, uh, this is the vintage of the different power plants, and these brown ones are the coal ones. You can see most of them are built in this period. This is a little more detail on the coal plants. This is the cap capacity of coal fire generation in the United States by first year of operation. Okay, so 1943, actually maybe 42, the oldest operating coal-fired power plant in the United States was first put into service. And you see a big bulge in the 70s, it really died down, and some, some new ones in the uh, latter part of the uh, Bush administration. I mean, to plan these things, you have to plan five, ten years ahead of time. So this, this tells you that most of the retirements that we've been seeing in coal are these old plants. In fact, take a little closer look. This, this is, the problem really is keeping that 1945 Chevy running. And uh, this is the car that was built at the same time as this power plant was built. And uh, a lot of these in here are this vintage. Now, some of you guys in here may have driven these things around in, in high school. Uh, and this, this here is, uh, doesn't look quite so antiquated, but it's not too new either. That's, that's sort of the, the, the oldest of these power plants, with a few exceptions. <coughs> Excuse me, around 1970. So that, that really, I think, uh, says what the retirement of coal plants is all about. It's finally having this grandfather and catching up with these really antiquated facilities. Okay, so that was, that was culprit number one, the environmental regulations. And the point I was trying to make was that uh, the environmental regulations have certainly played a role, but to a, a large extent, the regulations have served to keep the 45 Chevy running when it would have been in the junkyard back in the 80s or 70s. And, and finally, as things get piled on and on, all the other things that are going against coal, it's time to retire these things. I mean, to a certain extent, automobile pollution regulation in California is the same way. You've got these old cars that never rust out, and the environmental regulators have to figure out how to get them off the road. Okay, culprit number two, the deregulation of railroads. Uh, just look at this, this black line here. This is from 1981, which is about, about when the railroads were deregulated until the present, more or less, 2014. And this is the average railroad coal, railroad coal rate per ton mile. So that's the cost in uh, fractions of a cent. Actually, it's just, it's just not uh, normalized, but the cost is about a penny a ton mile uh, back then. This is the cost per ton mile of shipping coal by rail. And it's gone from uh, index of 100 went at deregulation down to about a third of that. It's gone up a bit since then. Well, that changes the picture a lot. And in fact, if you look at these two maps here, these are two mines in the United States. Remember, we, we produce about a billion tons of coal. This mine produces 100 million. This mine produces about 100 million as well. Actually, one produces 118, 101. Two mines, 20, 15, 20% of the whole US production. And where does that coal go? That coal goes everywhere. And if I had a map here in 1980, it would go here. 
something like that. Go to Illinois, maybe, not much further, because it's too expensive to ship it. So one of the results of the deregulation of railroads, which makes coal cheaper, or transportation cheaper, is that the market for Western coal has just, has just expanded over the entire country. And it's eaten alive the coal mines in Ohio and other eastern places. In fact, if you look up there, the 2015 mine mouth price, that's the price at the mine for coal, $13 a ton in Wyoming, $48 a ton in Ohio. So you, you know, you just, 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 just project that into when you're going down the line at Safeway, what that'll do to the market for coal. So the deregulation is certainly a major reason for killing the coal industry. Culprit number three is cheap natural gas. Now there are lots of cute pictures of fracking and I pulled this one out. Um, I think most people in here know what the, the approximate physics of fracking is. But uh, the point that's a really the important one is the price of gas, the orange line, and the price of coal. These compete with one another. Now, the price of gas back in, uh, this, this is, if, if those of you remember just uh, towards the end of the Bush administration, the price of gasoline, this is, this is natural gas, price of gasoline, remember, hit four or five dollars a, a gallon. Things were, things were pretty expensive there just before the recession started. Well, natural gas was doing the same thing. But, but the fracking revolution kicked in about the same time. And the price of natural gas dropped from $12 almost to parity with, with coal. And if you, if you keep in mind the technology of burning gas for electricity generation versus the technology of handling all that solid fuel and um, putting together a power plant to burn coal, uh, even though the price of gas is more expensive than coal, it's much more competitive with coal you got your choice. I mean, you can, even co uh, you can even burn the gas with the coal. In fact, they do that. So it's, uh, it's not quite as crisp a distinction. But gas has really been killing coal, really been killing coal. So there's not a whole lot of question that this is probably the main culprit. Um, now, let's look at productivity now. I love this picture here. This is this is this is this is productivity at work. I mean, these are these are people. These are, these are not these are not ten foot people, or you know, these are not two foot people. This is a, this is a, a this is like at one of those mines in Wyoming, running the coal around, and uh, it's uh, the it, it's it's almost free to mine coal in Wyoming. It's, it's got a, you know, a few feet of what they call overburden, the dirt on top of the coal, 200 foot seams. It's just, it's, 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 it's cheap. And that's, these, these, these machines have just gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, and their productivity gains have really been dramatic. Now th this one up here is a, a long wall miner. Which, which many of you are probably familiar with. It's, uh, I, I did go in a coal mine once upon a time, in the McKinley Mine in New Mexico, an underground coal mine. These are underground machines, and it's really impressive. You, got, you basically have a, um, an auger. Whoops, wrong button. You have an auger right here that just keeps grinding away at the coal seam. <clears throat> you got this mechanical roof support with the hydraulic. Uh, support, and you take a cut along the coal, and then you march this machine forward three feet, and let the roof collapse behind you. It's almost as if you're, you know, it's like a, it's like Pac-Man, eating his way through the coal seam, and you just you don't have to support the roof. The roof is supported by that machine. It just really uh, cuts through the the coal seam and, and really lowers the cost of producing underground, and this is what they use a lot in the Midwest and the East. But both of them, productivity improvements. So here we have the productivity 
changes in uh, coal over time. Um, this is the product labor productivity in coal mining generally, this blue line. It's gone up quite a bit since 1980. The green line is the productivity in western coal. That's where that big dump truck is. And this is the productivity in eastern coal. They haven't done quite so well, but that's, that's allowed them to hang on to their jobs. But it's also why it costs $50 a ton to produce the coal there. So productivity gains explain that, that figure at the beginning of the talk, the fact that jobs have really gone downhill in coal while we're doubling the amount of coal we're producing. And to get, this, this I think is, this is one of my favorite graphs. It's got nothing to do with coal. This is uh, the manufacturing share of gross domestic product in the United States. All manufacturing, you know, that make this thing. So this is probably from Korea. But all manufacturing in the United States has been constant since 1960. It has a 10 to 15% share of our output in the United States. But manufacturing, has, employment, has gone down dramatically, more than a factor of two. And that's where all the jobs going to Mexico that we hear about that's what's happening. Productivity is going up, so people that are still working in the Midwest or elsewhere are getting paid more because they're more productive, but there are not so many jobs to make the same output. And the same thing happened in coal. I've got to back up so I can see what i got here. Uh, now, culprit number five, productivity gains elsewhere, particularly in solar and wind. And when an economist says productivity gains, that's sort of the <clears throat> same thing as costs going down. You know, the costs are a result of how much it costs to produce things. If you're more productive, you produce them at lower costs. So here we have silicon PV cells. How many people have uh, solar cells on the top of their house? Uh, you see, if I'd done this even 20 years ago, nobody. And this, this is dramatic. This is really dramatic. I mean, it's almost zero down here, the cost of solar. Wind has taken a, uh, a, a real dive down, too. The, this has created a competitor like natural gas that's really made hot coal hard to argue for. Culprit six, uh, financial markets. Now, this I don't have quite so much evidence on. Um, I know that Wall Street opposed Texas Utilities expanding its coal capacity for financial reasons. Uh, when, a, when a utility needs to raise money for a new power plant, they have to go to Wall Street um, and sell bonds or, or stocks. And if Wall Street evaluates them and considers they're risky, well, the price goes up, the, you know, the cost of, cost of capital, the interest rate you have to pay. And it, it just happens that around the world, the, all of the arrows are pointing away from coal for, um, for, coal, for electricity generation. And uh, that's translating into making it a bad financial decision domestically, no matter what the government says. OK, so the bottom line here is that coal is doing better than coal jobs. And coal jobs are what Americans care most about. Uh, and we shouldn't forget that the well-being of coal miners' owners is also deteriorating. And they're also the people that have donated big time to um, certain political causes. The market capitalization, and if Bill Gates is in the audience somewhere that I don't see, he should pay attention. The market capitalization of U.S. coal industry is $4 billion. So if you've got an extra $4 billion, you can go buy the coal industry and make it into a museum if you want. It, I mean, that's, that's remarkable. Just a couple of years ago, it was $30 billion. Um, productivity, I think, is the real culprit here. Progress. That's, you know, productivity, progress, same sort of thing. Productivity gains in coal mining, fewer jobs. Productivity gains in natural gas production. That's 
where fracking is, lowers the cost of producing natural gas. Productivity gains in rail transport, lowers the cost. Productivity gains in solar and wind, lowers the cost. And poor old coals still, uh, remember that graph of productivity in eastern coal has been stagnant for, for 30, 40 years. Uh, also, I think a, a hidden story is interregional competition. This is the West, which we all live in, at least California is. The West really has benefited over the last 50 years in the coal industry. Not, not California so much, but the Wyoming and Montana particularly. And, the, and they've taken market share from the East. It's really two regions competing and the West won. And the East is complaining. They're not complaining about the West. They're, they're complaining about uh, other things that they think have caused it, like Obama's war on coal. But it's really interregional competition. Uh, institutional reforms are also responsible. The railroads are deregulated by changing the law. And the deregulation of utilities has made them more cost conscious. Environmental regulations, I think, are way down the list. Personally, uh, there's been a, they've temporarily benefited coal, keeping it operating, but you know now now it's time to pay the piper. Okay, so but that's not the end, that was the end of the story three weeks ago. <laughs> now it's not the end of the story. So uh, Trump digs coal, which is metaphoric. <laughs> uh, EPA had Pruitt, this, I, I don't know the dates, but this is in the last two or three weeks. EPA had Pruitt attempts to cancel the clean power plan. Uh, he also attempts to reduce the social cost of carbon to make weaker carbon regulations past a cost-benefit test. Um, Secretary of Interior loosens federal coal leasing regulations. Problem is that the problem is Western coal. And that's where the federal coal is. So if you make it easier to mine Western coal, you're going you're gonna to take even more jobs away from the Midwest. And we haven't even talked about what President Trump wants to do about natural gas. He wants to make that easier to produce. Well, that's going to kill coal, too. So uh, you know, going against the market is really difficult. Then finally, uh, most recently, I think it was last Friday or something yeah. like that, or maybe a week before, uh, Department of Energy had Perry who only recently realized that he was, his job wasn't to go around promoting oil and gas, um, asks FERC, the Federal Energy Regula Regulatory Commission, to subsidize coal and nuclear for reliability reasons. So he wants, he wants us to keep, or the country to, to keep coal and nuclear plants operating, and he wants the federal government to pay them to keep operating. So uh, we, we got, I've only got four minutes left, but let me go quickly um, through just four slides on those four actions. Progress towards the goal of the clean power plan. Um, this is pro the progress towards the goals of the clean power plan. And keep in mind the clean power plan it hasn't gone into effect yet. And the Supreme Court stated it, and Pruitt's reversing it. but. These states are likely to meet the goals of the Clean Power Plan by 2030. These states are close to hitting the targets. These are likely to miss the goals. That's without doing anything at all, mostly because of natural gas. If natural gas prices went up again, this picture would change a little bit. In fact, this uh, rhodium group, which I'm not, is it, a good group, but it, it's, it, um, it was Hillary Clinton's analysis group. So. It, I can't vouch for the, you know, how the, preci the precision of the analysis, but they basically are saying that this was the target of the clean power plan. This blue uh, uh, river here is the uh, their estimate of the baseline without the clean power plan. So, the clean power plan is one of those things that gets a lot of uh, people worked up, but the market is moving away from carbon, no matter what the plans say. Uh, he also proposed cutting the social cost of carbon. That's a little more subtle. Uh, the social cost of carbon is the estimate of the damage to the globe from climate change from one more ton, ton of carbon emitted. 
EPA estimates pre-Trump were about $40 a ton, of which only the domestic component, the US component, was $3. The rest is other countries. Um, Pruitt wants to only focus on the domestic part, leave out the other, which would make it much easier for weak uh, carbon regulations to pass a cost-benefit test. Loosening coal leasing, well, I've already talked about that. That's really not going to do anything at all. Uh, then this DOE asking FERC to mandate subsidies for coal and nuclear. It's a little more complicated. Uh, the idea is that if we move to all solar and wind, there's going to be some reliability problems. That's, that's the argument that DOE is making. And thus, we have, to ha we have to keep some of these nukes and coals, coal plants operating on reserve just in case. And plus, they, they want to be subsidized, or the proposal is to subsidize them, to keep coal piles ready, ready, on, ready to go. Uh, the problem with that is that reliability has always been an important issue in, in the country, and, and utilities are, are mandated to keep their reliability up. I think the loss of load probability is supposed to be something like 1 in 10,000 at uh, any particular point in time. And they have lots of mechanisms for doing this. Uh, they don't necessarily need this to, 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 to meet that. But, but some European countries are pursuing a similar strategy, so the, the verdict is still, still out on this. Personally, I think this may result in some slowdown of retirements of these plants. But if you've got a plant on standby reserve, that's not necessarily translating into combustion of, if it's a coal plant, combustion of coal. So the emissions consequences and even the coal use consequences may be more, more minor and insignificant. And this is my last slide, um, but this is just my summary of the New York Times editorial of, uh, of yesterday. And you can go look at the New York Times to get a better uh, summary of that, along with their arguments. Thank you. Great. So, anybody have any uh, requests for clarifications or number seven uh, reasons and so on? Let's start with a couple students, then we'll come back right here. Okay, you. How about our friends in the back? Yeah. Any students? You got it. Yeah. So, four slides back, you showed three different groupings of states meeting their targets. Can you characterize why, in simple terms, why the three groups are performing differently? Well, uh, a lot of this is natural gas. That's driving a lot of this. So we all know that in the, in the West, natural gas is, is a dominant <coughs> It's a major fuel, particularly in California. We don't, we don't use any coal. So they use newer power plants? Well, with natural gas, we just have a lot of natural gas. And we also have, have uh, environmental regulations. So a lot of the coal plants are in the interior. And California doesn't want any uh, coal electricity. A lot of these plants are old. They're from the 60s and 70s. Their, their, their lifetime is marginal at best. They're being retired. So, and this is also this population growth, which, which tends to, when you get population growth, um, you basically, it allows you to build, build new of whatever you're building and retire old ones. It's when you're stagnant that it's more difficult. And Florida's got this, some of the same issues. It's a, it's a little bit different picture in different states. Um, there's also energy efficiency that's, that's being pursued more aggressively in different places. So the, the, the Clean Power Plan gave you several ways of doing, including natural gas. That was, that was okay. So it's, it's, a, it's a little, there's some idiosyncrasies among the different states. But that's, that's, that's a broad brush picture. Uh, back up here and then across. Why did you exclude gas from their uh, recent order to. Why did who? DOE. Why did they exclude gas from the request? Well, that, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, gas makes a very, very good way of supporting reliability. Uh, that, in fact, uh, that's, that's a really good question. It hadn't occurred to me because that's a signal that it's not really for reliability. It's for other purposes. That's a, that's a very good point. Good. Here and then there. Oops, never mind. He's in charge. <laughs> when you compare the eastern versus western coal, 
What makes the West Bank coal so much cheaper to produce? Ah, it's just sitting on the ground. Strip mines versus deep mines. The other stuff's underground for the most part. I mean, there is a surface and underground in the east. But it's been, been mined for a long time. It's not so accessible. You know, you've got the App Appalachia. We've all heard about mountaintop removal. It's just a messier, pro a messier project. It's sort of like if you go out in the Central Valley and you remove 10 feet of dirt, the whole Central Valley is 200 feet of coal. That's sort of the, the mental image of the Powder River Basin. Just Gee. Over here and then back to Rob Jackson. Yeah, so uh, along those lines, how is that huge uh, differential in cost uh, maintainable? I mean, why doesn't everybody, because the more could be produced in the West, they're not all operating at capacity. So why aren't more people switching away from Eastern coal to Western coal? Well, they are. But, uh, you know, this is... Is that it? What the transport one? Oh, this one here. Uh, you know they are. This is Western coal. This is Eastern coal. But there, there are, there are some, uh, there, there are some footnotes. Um, you know, basically, you have some, you have a number of power plants built next to the coal mines. Uh, if you, if you look, if you look at the, a lot of these power plants, they're along the Ohio Midwestern ones. They're along. The, on the Ohio River, where it's virtually free to move the coal along the water there. There are also plants that are built, um, when you, when you some, some of you know this better than I do, but when you, when you design a coal-fired power plant, you design it for the coal you're burning. And making a change is not so easy to do. Um, so, it's, it, and some of these are actually uh, captive mines, you know, they're, Mine was built and power plant was built. They sort of go together. So there's, uh, there are reasons why it still sticks around. But the, your point is a good one. You know why? Why hasn't the Midwestern coal market disappeared altogether? And um, uh, transport more complicated. Rob and then back up here. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. That was great um, and timely. The, just a couple of quick things. I mean, first of all, the reliability issue for gas. The reason gas isn't included is because you can't have 90 days of supply on site. Now, whether that's you know whether that reliability is the real reason, I, I'm not saying that, but there is a there is a reason why gas isn't included. That's a um, very very good point. I mean, every couple of winters there's a gas shortage because everybody's running their heat. To, the pipelines are fast. And then, then just two other ones quickly. And I was uh, really interested in a railroad analogy, which I hadn't heard. And so it seems like some of your factors contribute to a loss of jobs, but should ultimately increase the, you know, the the, the price competitiveness of coal. So you would think the, the the deregulation of the railroad industry would help coal as a as a market and might hurt jobs. So those two things are really different. And then just the last one was. In, in terms of regulation, you didn't really talk about environmental or electric, uh, you know, renewable portfolio standards and renewable electricity standards in more than 30 states. So I was wondering what role you think those play. Well, I, th I think the renewable portfolio standards uh, help wind and solar a lot and other renewables. And to the extent that they're competing away the market from, from coal, they certainly do play a part. Uh, but the, they're not, they're not part of the natural gas coal equation, and I that to me that seems like a dominant uh, a dominant a, a, a dominant pressure. But certainly the ability of coal or wind and uh, solar to um, to compete with coal is is fueled by not just the renewable portfolio standards. I mean, just think of us here in California, how much the state gives you to put solar on your roof, sort of part of the same, part and parcel of the same thing. So you're right, that has, a, that has a significant role too. Do you want to talk, if I understood the first question right, it's What's just that? the deregulation of railroads makes coal transport cheaper, which makes Western coal competitive in more parts of the country. So you can go farther east before you actually compete with the underground coal mine. You actually had that as your next point. Yeah, I mean, you got to remember that the Western coal, by the time it gets transported to Ohio, is no longer $15 a ton. It's now $45 a ton, 
so it's sort of competing with the, the Ohio coal, uh, at least some of the Ohio coal. There's cheap Ohio coal and expensive Ohio coal. Okay, we're so, going to do three back here, here, and there. And then we're, John Mash always gets the last words as long as he's brief. Should go. Can you describe the subsidy more? Uh, what, what's the subsidy, the subsidy that was asked for nuclear and, and coal? What well, that's, that's uh, very new, and the subsidy is not clear at all. Uh, there, all I've seen is a letter from the Department of Energy to the FERC, the Federal Re Energy Re Regulatory Commission, requesting that there be a fair uh, subsidy that, that gives a fair rate of return to qualified uh, generating stations in coal and nuclear uh, that are outside rate of return regulation. So it's, 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 it's left to be d fleshed out. But it's whatever it takes to get that rate of return, as you said, yeah. yeah. Does it mention anything about coal prices? It doesn't, it does, coal it's prices really, doesn't mention it. It's not that, it's, it's just one paragraph. Yeah. It just says make it, make the results of it. It doesn't say how to get there. Yeah. I had a question actually about the graphs of the chair. Um, so if you have a lot of graph, you see the picture the in the east has been going, been going down significantly since the early 90s. But then if you look at the other graph, you see that the employment's actually risen in the early 2000s. And I was wondering whether you knew how that happened. Uh, so you're saying that th th it's been going down here. Well, the east, of course, is a big place and not, not homogeneous. I mean, it's particularly since it also includes the Midwest. Uh, but I, I really don't know how, uh, to, how to answer that. You, you're basically saying that the employment stayed roughly, roughly constant, even going up a little bit. Oh, wait a second, which one am I looking at? Yeah, the red, uh, which is in the opposite direction of that. Yeah, I, I can't explain that. What's that? Production. So production went up faster. No, uh, Overall production went up faster than the... Uh, this, is, this is the east. The, red, the blue line here. Uh, this this is uh, uh, not a good graph. This is the east, the red line here. So uh, the blue line went down since the uh, 90s, and the, uh, uh, the red line has gone up a little bit. But, you Probably know, heterogeneity. Be interesting. Look I can't that. explain it. Okay, so we have third row, third row aisle here, ma'am. Oh, um, about the question about the subsidies for nuclear and coal plants, and that the issue sounded like it was reliability. And, uh, so I have a science background, so this obviously has an economic view, but is there a technical view, a oh. non-political view, about how much of other sources of energy besides solar and wind do we need to have in order to have a stable system? Is there, is there such an answer? Oh, it's, a pure, uh, it's almost entirely a technical issue. Yeah. And you've, you've got random events, which could be the, the sun not shining for, for the supply side or the wind not blowing, or cold, cold weather, uh, or breaking of equipment. And uh, as some of you power system engineers know, there's, uh, you, you look at the probability of all those things happening, and you come up with that what's the likelihood of, of a loss of a failure to meet load at a given instant in time, and that's your reliability it has to be up to a certain level. And, and there, you know, there's some justification for saying that, uh, well, coal and nuclear have this advantage of being able to, uh, particularly coal, being able to quickly respond and generate electricity if, if the events need it. Um, so, you know, there, there is, there's, there's some basis for that, but there are other ways you can get reliability. You can, uh, it's, it's a probabilistic um, frontier and you can change, change the amount you've got on other things. So it's not necess necessarily required. But even if, even if you had coal standing by, or nuclear, it doesn't mean you burn the coal very much anyway. You have it standing by. So the implications for the emissions is unclear. This will be a good question to save for two weeks from now, again, because Kilicote, who's our Bits and Watts executive director, smart grid person, actually has a title that's how to do reliable 
100% renewable, so she's looked into that. The more the technical issues on that side, as Charlie mentioned. Last word, John. Yeah, can you maybe address the sort of interregional politics of some of this? Because, like, you got Peabody Coal out in Wyoming, uh, but uh, Robert Murray, okay, who I'm sure you know of, okay, yeah, right, okay, uh, uh, which is Murray uh, Energy is in the is in the Midwest, Ohio, and Ohio. Ohio. Yeah, right. Right. He claims right credit for this 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 recent uh, couple weeks stuff. Well, he all, one, I, I've seen his talk, so I don't know. He also it. claims credit for long wall mining yeah. advances. Yeah, right. Yeah. So he's. He claims know. a lot of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, but I guess the question is can you give a, a quick insight? Because there's some conflicting things in, in some of these actions that are being taken about the sort of political power of the different coal groups. Well, I don't want to impugn Robert Murray's motives, but I do know that when uh, um, Romney was running in 2012, that uh, he announced that just uh, I think in September that he was going to close uh, coal mines uh, in Ohio because of Obama's war on coal and you better vote for Romney. And then in January after the election he uh, rescinded that announcement of uh, going to close the coal mines. And he's, you know, he sued the EPA and lost uh, for, for uh, regarding the war on coal. So, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a businessman. He, he owns these coal mines, and if coal goes, goes that's, there goes his retirement. So, I don't really But it's, I mean, it's, it's a very good point. Uh, 30 seconds. Well, since, the, uh, since you say that uh, <coughs> maybe the reasons why uh, coal jobs have gone down is because of increased uh, productivity in all these various energy sectors, uh, could one possibly imagine the EPA coming up with regulations to deliberately try and decrease the productivity of renewables no. and uh, natural gas? I mean, I mean and I'm just thinking I think we have, our, draconian we have an immediate uh, response here, yes? Yeah, they can eliminate the ITC credit. Yeah. I mean, wind, Investment wind, tax. Wind is, not, <coughs> wind is not a viable source right at this point in time. It wasn't for the 30 cents per kilowatt hour. Investment tax credit, right. yeah. So if they eliminate the ITC, that will have So they'll try. We'll see. Yeah, that'll just for when, but gas. Okay, so we're just about here. Let's thank Charlie one last time.